Warning, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, hello, welcome everybody. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center. And I'm here to introduce Listening to Our Sanctuaries, Understanding and Reducing the Impacts of Underwater Noise in Marine Protected Areas. And I'm pleased to introduce Layla Hatch, who is going to be our speaker today. Uh, I also want to thank EBM Tools and Open Channels, who are co-sponsoring this webinar series with us. This is a monthly series on strengthening MPA networks. Uh, so just briefly to introduce Layla, she is a marine ecologist at Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary off the northeast coast of the U.S. And her research focuses on characterizing underwater soundscapes, assessing the impacts of ocean noise on marine mammals, and designing management actions to address those impacts. And she supports acoustic science and policy initiatives throughout NOAA's National Marine Sanctuary System and co-leads NOAA's ocean noise strategy effort. Prior to her graduate work, Dr. Hatch participated in international whale and dolphin research programs focusing on both basic behavioral ecology and impacts to populations associated with human activities. So Layla, I'm going to turn it over to you in just a moment. I just wanted to let all the participants know that we will be having Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please type them into the question box and we will get to those uh, at the end of the presentation. Thanks very much. Over to you, Layla. Thanks very much, Lauren. Um, thanks to the center for giving this, this opportunity to talk to you guys today. Um, I'm going to divide my presentation today. Oh, I I hmm. OK, sorry. <laughs> Why are you dancing? I'm going to divide my presentation today uh, into three sections. First, I'm going to talk about ocean noise and the kinds of problems it's presenting to animals. And then I'm going to talk about the agency that I work for, that's the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and their approach to managing ocean noise, both historically and, and looking towards the future. And I'm going to move through these two first sections quickly to get to the final section, which is of most interest to this audience. And that's the role that marine protected areas can play in addressing ocean noise issues. So the problem um, of uh, noise starts with the importance of sound to animals underwater. And most people's understanding of that importance comes from some knowledge of the marine species that make sounds to communicate, with the best known being the whales and the dolphins and the porpoises. And this communication role for sound is very important. It's, it's important far beyond the relatively few marine mammals that are out there. And is better and better documented among fish and, and marine invertebrate species. That said, this focus on communication has been a real stumbling block to a broader understanding of the role that sound plays for animals underwater, which encompasses the many, many ways that species are using their hearing. Because light degrades so quickly underwater, vision is a less important sensory mode than on land. And the wi a wide range of species, far more than use sound to communicate, use sound as the or a main mechanism by which they gather information from their environments. And this includes overhearing the calls or movement of species that might eat them or that they might eat, recognizing geophysical features and by their uh, acoustic signatures and using those cues in larval sediment pa settlement patterns or in, in navigation. And as it says here, more as we learn. So the first thing that I want to do in this talk is ensure that we think about the problem of noise uh, relative to its effects on this broader role of hearing. So animals need to hear underwater, and the problem is that we're making it harder for them to do that. Many of the things we are doing offshore produce noise, either purposefully as a signal or incidentally as a byproduct. And examples of that purposeful introduction of sound might include the, the many types of sonars we use to find fish or detect submarines, other kinds of targets, map the seafloor, um, and the use of air guns to detect oil and gas reserves beneath that, that seafloor. We, we produce noise as a byproduct of moving goods all around the world by ship um, and by constructing and operating and decommissioning offshore platforms, among, among other things. So the effects of this noise we broadly consider in two contexts. The first is acute, acute impacts um, that are associated with animals that are relatively close to loud, short-term, noisy events. Um, this second category is impacts associated with animals over much larger areas who are trying to hear or be heard over background noise conditions that are getting louder. And that latter category relates to that same quality of underwater sound 
that makes it so useful to species. Here, the ability of sound, particularly low frequency or, or those low tones on your piano sound, move through water without losing energy over very great distances. And, and that means that all of the sources of noise that are present in a very large deep water area, like an ocean basin, collectively can contribute to a growing hum. And that hum is pervasive, and it can represent the accumulated low frequency energy from hundreds of sources, like commercial ships or ongoing oil and gas exploration activity in a region or, or, and other sources. There are not that many places on the planet where we have been able to measure changes in background noise levels over the past 50 years. But where we have, like off the central California coastline in the US in this graph, we see increases of about three decibels per decade. So that represents a doubling of acoustic power at some of those low frequencies every 10 years since 1950. Our focus on considering noise impacts underwater has been based heavily on a noise threshold model. And that can be sort of cartooned like this. First, let's put ourselves on land, where we're the most comfortable. And then let's add this source of loud noise. We've been focused on the most serious direct physical injuries to animals who are close by, followed by the potential for things like temporary hearing loss, behavioral changes, and maybe some communication interference at greater distances, where noise levels remain higher than specified threshold levels, here represented as these domes, and where they've been, those thresholds have been linked to specific studies of animals, animal impacts. So in attempting to address chronic noise impacts, it's useful to look at that same cartoon, but in a different way, and instead focus on this bird as a listener. And these domes now become various different horizons for the volume within which that bird can hear sounds of interest. Now this outer dome represents natural conditions. And nature is not silent. There are plenty of sources of natural noise that shape that horizon for species. This inner dome, however, represents a decreased listening volume based on medium levels of chronic background noise due to human activities, and this most inner circle represents the most severe losses of hearing capabilities for that bird. We call the acoustic spaces that animals are using to detect signals of importance to their survival their acoustic habitats, which parallels terminology for their other habitat needs. We can use our increasing understanding of the status of today's acoustic environment or soundscapes to quantify the losses of acoustic habitat that are occurring for acoustically sensitive species in noisy areas, such as these fin whales calling down here in the Mediterranean Sea uh, relative to the fin whales calling up here in a quieter Gulf of California, or these right whales calling during quieter moments versus louder moments in Massachusetts Bay. So we, what we don't know a whole lot about um, is the link between such losses of acoustic habitat and what we call fitness effects, changes in the survivorship and reproductive success of individuals. And I put this figure from a recent paper on chronic noise up, impacts up, summarizing these various pathways between noise occurring, the failure by animals to be able to detect cues, like other individuals calling you, or predators, or prey, where you, or where to go, where to settle, and the types of fitness results that are increasingly being documented across terrestrial and marine taxa. And this column over here on the right represents um, an ongoing and an ever greater list of studies that are sort of filling in documentation of those links. So before we leave this section, I just want to underscore one thing. There's a lot of emphasis in determining impacts on how loud a signal is. But the frequency content of noise, that is how its energy is distributed over tone, like the keys on your piano again, is really key. And in terms of chronic noise, this is particularly true because the, of the ability of low frequency, long wavelength sounds to be heard over very large distances, while higher frequencies become inaudible much more quickly. So here you see one signal, an air gun, that has energy on the top spectrogram in a broad range of frequencies. And frequency here is, is on your vertical axis. And that's true when you measure it close by. But as you get further away on the bottom, 
it is still detectable, but only those lower frequency content remains. So frequency is really key to determining the spatial scale over which a source is uh, maybe contributing to noise impact concerns. But it also depends how much of an impact it will have on any one species hearing or communication capability, since every species hearing system is tuned differently. So for example, species that are tuned to hear lower frequencies and use them to communicate, like these baleen whales over here, um, sorry, baleen whales right here, um, uh, they're going to be um, a real strong concern in terms of overlap with primary noise from commercial shipping. While concerns for some of these odonaces further to um, the right on that chart um, are going to be uh, less concern, less severe. So on to NOAA and uh, the agency's approach to noise. In the US, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration is the lead agency responsible for reducing or eliminating the impacts of noise on marine species. And we do this through a variety of statutory authorities. Some of the primary ones that have been important to date are related to our protected and endangered marine mammal species. But the role of noise in National Marine Sanctuary Impact Assessment and in Environmental Impact Assessment more broadly under NEPA, those roles have, have really been continuing to increase. And because of our growing understanding regarding the need to address noise in both acute contexts, um, that's those loud, noisy events that occur near animals, and in chronic and more cumulative contexts, and the need to broaden the taxonomic focus of our management to include other acoustically sensitive species like fish and invertebrates. For these reasons, NOAA has really committed to augmenting its management approach to noise. And we started that in 2010. The agency led a one-year effort, which became sort of nicknamed Set Sound, and that was for short for cetacean and sound mapping to develop geospatial tools that could assist managers um, in addressing noise more comprehensively for these target species. And set map, um, uh, the set map group, uh, this group worked on coalescing resources that were available to describe the distribution and density of whales, dolphins, and porpoises, um, and then to further describe areas of biological importance to these areas. Then the sound map group developed first-order maps of the contribution of noise from human activities to chronic average background noise conditions throughout US waters. These products are, are available and became available in 2012 uh, on the website that's, that's at the bottom here. Um, they were shared in a, a very large stakeholder forum in 2012 and some exploratory ideas for how to, how to really apply them to noise management were presented at that, at that meeting. And this is an example uh, provided by Pat Halpin at, at Duke Marine Lab, um, who discussed how these background average noise level maps in a frequency band relative to a North Atlantic right whale, um, or relevant, sorry, to a, a North Atlantic right whale, might be used to, to assess uh, some more cumulative impacts to the species over its migratory lifetime within US coastal waters. So this was an example of a potential use for these mapping tools in a species-specific protection model. Carrie Cable from US Santa, UC Santa Barbara and ENSYS uh, examined the, the, the use of similar tools, but in a place-based protection model. She integrated average low-frequency noise within this map of cumulative impacts from a variety of offshore stressor types off the northeast coast of the US and, and including the waters of the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And the resulting depiction of total impact as high within the sanctuary back to the question, given the importance of sound to ecological processes within sanctuaries, do we have a responsibility to protect the acoustics of these spaces? And if so, how? Um, and that's a question we're going to get back to very shortly. So following the symposium, NOAA determined that this work really needed to continue and that what was needed next was an agency-wide ocean noise strategy that could present a longer-term vision for the agency's science and management actions on noise, as well as provide guidance for achieving that vision. 
Within NOAA, we then created a diverse team of fish and invertebrate and whale and area-based and habitat-based and buoy people and, and legal experts all to work together to articulate this vision and um, to draft a framing document. And that document has the following content. It has three chapters focused on NOAA's objectives for characterizing soundscapes, uh, directing species-focused management, and directing habitat-focused management. Uh, it then has some implementation case studies and some appendices that, that go into more detail on what the um, uh, NOAA's policy and science, it sort of go into greater detail on the inventory of NOAA's, NOAA's science and policy tools. So I've highlighted this one with the, that's the most important to the rest of my talk today and uh, provided you with a few other names of folks in mean, addition to myself who, including, and including Charlie Wally from the Marine Protected Area Center because this articulation of habitat-based management of noise is, is seeking to provide managers with tools to evaluate and take action on this issue within priority places. I wanted to just note that um, the work under the Ocean Noise Strategy has also continued uh, external to NOAA, and I know there are people in this audience from other countries and other U.S. agencies, so I've, I've just included a, a very few very recent examples here of some of these activities, including um, some interagency federal U.S. effort to identify and support common science and management goals, a task force that was created um, uh, this year, to, and we'll be working this year on that issue. Um, work at the International Maritime Organization uh, of the UN, where we're really focused on um, uh, shipping noise and guidelines to reduce noise, technical guidelines to reduce noise uh, from commercial vessels. Those guidelines were actually passed last month. And uh, that's a, been a really important milestone for the team that's been working on that, including some NOAA folks. Um, and uh, third, we, we just held an, um, an international workshop co-sponsored by the International Whaling Commission, the International Quiet Ocean Experiment, Experiment the U.S.'s Navy's Global Program, and the Netherlands Ministry of the Environment were all focused on trying to um, uh, expand the global coverage of these underwater sound maps to support management at larger scales. So more information on, on these types of efforts and, and the products that they're developing will, will hopefully also be available on this on a website which we're expanding right now. Okay, so now on to MPAs um, and the role that they are and, and can play in addressing ocean noise. Here I'm drawing heavily from the work of the group that's been drafting uh, that place-based or habitat-based management framework chapter for the for the NOAA uh, the NOAA Ocean Noise Strategy. So the finalization and availability of that of that is going to serve in the coming months as, to to be able to expand on these ideas. But clearly, there is an important role to be played by marine protected areas in more fully characterizing and sustaining acoustic habitat needs of species. And the importance of this role to any one marine protected area can be evaluated according to several considerations. The presence of acoustically sensitive or active species, are such species rare or are they common or are they resident? Uh, acoustic habitat concerns are, are clearly going to be a higher priority for areas with periodically common or resident acoustically sensitive species. Then the target of ecological protection, some MPAs, as uh, this audience knows, so well, such as critical habitats for individual endangered species or essential fish habitats for commercially valued species, these are created to support specific species of concern, while others, like national marine sanctuaries, are created to protect all living and non-living resources. So although both types of areas can address acoustic impacts, the more comprehensive goals of places like sanctuaries can more easily address the broader interest in protecting the role of sound in ecological and, and ecosystem function. Uh, a third way of looking at this is, is, is through um, the, the MPA's uh, nexus to threats. Um, some protective areas address singular threats, such as restricting a particular gear type within an area, versus others are seeking to reduce or eliminate and, and uh, injury from all threats. Clearly, that latter category more easily encompasses noise, since no area has yet been created to just address noise in isolation. And again, those areas could include sanctuaries. Finally, um, areas have differing knowledge bases and access to scientific infrastructure. 
that they could they could use to characterize noise conditions or noise impacts and that might very uh, have strong effects on their ability to actually prioritize noise as a threat. So understanding noise status and contribution is vital to understanding whether the management tools that can be accessed by any one location are likely to be effective or not. So following this thinking, within NOLA's portfolio, portfolio um, National Marine Sanctuaries clearly have a very strong reasons to prioritize protection of acoustic habitat. And indeed, um, quality of acoustic conditions within these sites is a rising concern. However, none of the sites in the system prohibit the introduction of noise within their boundaries. Instead, impacts from noise are increasingly being addressed via the National Marine Sanctuary Act's mandate that other federal agencies that are promoting activities that may affect sanctuary resources need to consult with NOAA. So those consultations take the form of NOAA providing recommendations to the activity promoting agency regarding actions they should take to reduce or eliminate injury to sanctuary resources. And commonly, um, uh, these recommendations to address noise impacts include suggestions that the activity should not take place within sanctuary or should not take place within an area inclusive of sanctuaries, but with, and additionally with a standoff or a buffered area in order to uh, reduce insonification within the site. Recommendations to restrict timing of events to reduce overlap with the presence of acoustically sensitive species are also common, as are mitigation and monitoring programs that include either using passive acoustic or uh, um, real-time or archival passive acoustic systems. Clearly, the, the goals of reducing impacts to all living and non-living resources within sanctuaries overlap with wider ranging but more species-specific mandates to protect marine mammals, endangered species, commercially important fish. So there's an increasing uh, cross-NOAA effort to align our development of mitigation and monitoring requirements or, or these recommendations as appropriate to better achieve protective goals in places that are important to marine life. So these consultation tools are useful and have provided important mechanisms for dialogue with other federal action agencies about the sanctuary's goals of protecting the acoustic quality of these sites. That said, they do not represent a direct mandate to manage sanctuary acoustic conditions. We are using sanctuary legislation to indirectly manage noise conditions via the potential for noise to affect sanctuary resources or the ecological processes in these places. So this is, a, this is an important contrast to other protected areas with, that have a far more direct mandate, including national parks. So under the National Park Service's 2006 management policy, states that the National Park Service will preserve to the greatest extent possible the natural soundscapes of parks. And this policy further defines as unacceptable impacts that unreasonably interfere with the atmosphere of peace and tranquility or the natural soundscape, and still further requires the use of the natural ambient noise conditions as a reference condition for restoration. So that's a real institutionalization um, to soundscape management for terrestrial national park management. And, and because of this, the park service Park Service has, has developed a system-wide sound monitoring system that allows them to make comparisons of noise conditions among their sites and over time within their sites. And that really is the support, support system that managers need to refine their conservation targets to really understand um, the time trajectories and the status conditions and, and to really refine where they're trying to go with restoration. It's of interest, of course, that this management and measurement history does not extend to national marine parks, many of which would prioritize acoustic habitat protection for the same reasons as marine sanctuaries. That said, marine protected areas are pushing this issue forward and, and providing a, a setting for science that can inform acoustic habitat management. At the site where I work, Stellag and Bank, we have been focused on characterizing the noise influence of the many types of commercial and recreational vessel traffic we have within our area. And then using those characterizations to model the changes in the acoustic areas over which animals like right whales can hear each other call 
during their key feeding time when they're in our waters. And as I mentioned, we're, we're quantifying losses averaging over 70% in this area between historically quieter conditions and modern times for animals like our calling right whales. This work is, is broadening now to include a uh, partnership with colleagues at NOAA Fisheries, U uh, University of Connecticut, and the National Park Service to examine the acoustic monitoring data that's been collected throughout the sanctuary in relation to a variety of other high-resolution information regarding the distribution of habitats, acoustically active species, human activities, and other variables that we can use to predict variability in soundscapes. And, and the goal of doing that in, in places like the sanctuary where this information is high resolution is to, is to further the development of those metrics in order to be able to use them to assay areas where little is known about biodiversity or human activity levels. Our efforts to continue to build our soundscape measurement infrastructure among sanctuaries recently really took a big step forward um, as NOAA developed a nine-station uh, noise reference station program to, to listen throughout U.S. managed regions with three of those sites um, in, in sanctuaries. This represents a partnership between several NOAA line offices, and we really hope to see it grow. Uh, to include both additional stations and to support long-term database development across sites. So I'm only a, a few slides away now uh, from the end of my presentation. Um, and what I hope will be the beginning of some discussion. And so I wanted to, to summarize an acoustic habitat management objective for marine protected areas for, for you guys to think about. And that objective would be to better characterize and understand the ecological implications of noise in high priority marine protected areas and develop management approaches to more comprehensively maintain or restore important aspects of natural acoustic habitat. To meet this objective, uh, MPAs can play several important roles. First, they can serve as key locations for listening, as we were just talking about, documenting noise conditions, changes in acoustic conditions. And here I add not just uh, documenting average conditions, but documenting changes in the quietest conditions there and in the loudest conditions as well, both of which have other, uh, other um, relationships to impact. They can, uh, the sites can support efforts to uh, develop these standardized multi-site comparative ca uh, monitoring capabilities um, that are vital to us being able to better understand conditions and management targets. And they can support research that can uh, help us understand the full use of hearing and sounds by a wider variety of taxa. Second, because of their comprehensive mission to protect uh, all elements of ecological process, uh, there is commonly an overlap within some marine protected areas with more targeted but wider ranging protective missions associated with individual species or, um, uh, or, or habitat types. Much of what the, the NOAA Ocean Noise Strategy is seeking to accomplish is to align these interests and showcase ways that we can um, uh, bring their strengths and weaknesses to bear across different scales to address common problems. And due to the wide-ranging nature of, of many low-frequency noise types, these partnerships are going to be critical. And thus far, we've included international work on shipping noise, multilateral collaborations with our, our European colleagues who are addressing very similar concerns under their new marine strategy directive, um, some sponsorship I talked about with the International Whaling Commission that are interested at the scales of, uh, at which cetaceans operate. And here in the U.S., I've, I've talked about some collaboration with other federal programs like the National Sounds Program within the National Park Service. Finally, perhaps most importantly, um, Protected areas have really unique opportunities to provide the public with places where they can focus their conservation purpose and, and action. And to date, the public's association with noise impacts has been mainly via the animals that they love, these whales. 
and, um, and particularly towards these extreme injurious impacts from relatively rare noisy events like whales uh, stranding on beaches. And, and this engagement has been fraught with misunderstandings, and, and it really can stand in the way of a broader recognition of the conditions that animals need to survive, inclusive of the acoustic qualities, what the, those conditions look like contemporarily in places that people care about, like their sanctuaries and their parks, and what can be done to improve those conditions. And I often ask people to, to close their eyes as their first step to understanding what their ears are doing for them and to begin to understand how animals are using their ears underwater. There's a, there's a great deal being done to provide people with underwater experience without getting them wet. And we need to incorporate experience of noise concerns more creatively within those programs. As this quote says, that's going to go a long way towards creating the conservation opportunities of tomorrow for this issue. And with that, I, I think I'm, I'm done um, and would be very willing to take more questions. Okay. Okay, Layla, can you hear me? Are you guys hearing me? Yes, Lauren, yeah. we're here. OK. Sorry we have an echo in this room. I was hoping to get around. So I apologize to the folks in this room. <laughs> um, so a couple of questions that have come in, and I encourage folks to submit other questions. Uh, but here's one that's asking. Lauren, you might have Joanne turn her, the volume all the way down on her computer. Or and switch back and forth like for Layla's answers. That's what I just tried. OK. You know, how about if we be put on mute and Sarah, you facilitate the questions. Would that be all right? Um, sure. Sure. Just thank you. OK. Layla, are you there? Yes, I am. OK. Uh, let's see. There, um, Let's see, there was a question coming in from David Dow. Since BOEM is developing large-scale wind farms in federal jurisdiction waters, how will the acute noise associated with construction and chronic noise from operation be addressed in NOAA's research and management framework for noise effects on marine mammals and endangered species? Well, there is a lot of answers to that question. Um, but uh, I think many of the projects that um, um, federal agencies are working on right now to look at sort of programmatic scale uh, development of um, particular offshore energy um, are considering noise from both these angles of uh, cro chronic influence and acute influence. The chronic one um, as I've been talking about mostly here today really is pushing the envelope of our more traditional ways of, of addressing noise influence. So there's, there's quite a bit of focus, and it is necessary still, on, on those acute impacts from pile driving to animals that are relatively close by and, and preventing injury um, and our more traditional models for evaluating take. So that will all continue to be ongoing um, and involves, obviously, not only the action agencies, but NOAA through um, uh, statutes like the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. Um, this other consideration of chronic noise has come into uh, agencies' evaluations at programmatic scales um, under NEPA as they look at uh, larger, uh, larger scale development profiles and, and what the impacts are likely to be. And um, I think the hope is that NOAA's um, work on this strategy will provide um, some opportunities for moving that bar, that, that ball down the road, trying to understand how we could uh, better manage the chronic influences of projects like that. I don't think we're there um, right now in terms of uh, integrating it um, uh, completely into the NEPA documents of today, um, but this is this is the edge we're trying to push. 
Okay, thank you, Leah. Um, <clears throat> let's see another question from Jimmy. Uh, do you think it would be possible, or do you think it is possible that our increase in whale sightings is due to the fact that a big part of our EEZ has become a no-go area for ships over 300 gigatons? Hmm. I don't. Um, but I, I'm thinking about that no-go area and, and thinking um, I, I don't, um, uh, having looked at a lot of AIS data, I'm, um, um, I'm standing to be corrected. This is where you wish it was a dialogue and not a unidirectional thing. But um, about what areas of the EEZ, um, what proportions of the EEZ and those restrictions are being referred to here, that's going to matter a lot to my answer. My overarching feeling um, is that um, those increases in shipping traffic, although there are, are shifts in them, are uh, over and, uh, overall increasing, both in distribution and in density in, in many areas. And um, the in parallel uh, recoveries of some populations of animals um, have presented a lot of questions to people about um, if noise is such a problem, why are animals still here, or why are animals continuing to come, place, come back to places that are, are particularly noisy. And the answers there um, you know, are going to be complicated, but um, one part that I always try to bring into the mix is um, there's a large body of work on ecological niches, which uh, reminds us that um, animals need to be in certain places in the ocean. And um, uh, looking for them to abandon areas um, that are critically important to things like feeding and sustaining nursery populations and reproductive success, uh, we hope that we get to these problems before we see those kinds of catastrophic impl implications, because uh, that, that's our goal. OK, thank you, Leila. And Jimmy did send a little bit more information, but possibly not as much as we would need. Um, he said it's about 90% of our EEZ um, being a no-go area. And I guess we might want more. And I think he's talking about shifts specifically over 300 gigatons. So it might be helpful to more information along those lines. Jimmy would be helpful. And then he said 2,200 square kilometers. OK. Gotcha. But, OK. So that's okay. the biggest ship amongst us. I mean, and, and um, I think what um, I, uh, the, the work we've tended to do has been focusing on um, a bulk of uh, the commercial traffic that um, may not be in that last category. But it is true that understanding whether there's a, there's a disproportionate increase in noise associated with the very largest but least uh, but less abundant ship types versus a sort of uh, um, what proportion of that noise is driven by the more numerous uh, vessels that are in a slightly smaller category but still are a big vessel. That's, a lot of that detailed work is going on right now, uh, driven by these IMO interests and, and other interests. And we'll, it, it will help us understand whether we're looking, when we're looking at these guidelines for quieting vessels, at whether we need more targeted, you know, where, where those targets need to be. OK, thank you. And let's see, uh, there was a co comment and question. Ironic that the Park Service has regulations limiting noise for animals that probably depend a lot less on it than ocean animals. Is there any movement to adding similar uh, regulations to the NMSA? There is not any movement uh, right now on adding those regulations to the MSA. I think there is an, um, uh, it isn't, there is an interesting, there is, um, uh, irony to some degree associated with the terrestrial focus in parks. That said, um, uh, the link to human experiential um, visitor experience within parks has it makes it not so ironic in that um, that that is where soundscape management has its roots within parks. And so getting from that uh, framework um, under the ocean where humans are, are, are not the, the more typical visitors um, is it, uh, is a is a is a more difficult leap, and transitioning away from managing human experiences of part soundscapes and into managing the effects of soundscape quality on wildlife within parks more holistically has been a 
has been a path that, that, that parks on land have taken, and the, um, that latter path is the one that is going to have more inroads for, for marine parks. OK, thank you. Um, another question, are, are there marine species other than cetaceans that we know are particularly sensitive to noise? Uh, yes, I mean, I think we are continue, we're starting to really recognize, um, in fact, even just this week, I'm, I'm, I was looking at some coverage that was coming out in the media about the latest study, and they tend to be quite a few of them coming out increasingly about fish and their either communication response or um, some other kind of altered behavior relative to noise conditions. So there are a lot of low frequency active and, and or sensitive uh, fish species. Um, last year there was quite a, a bit of press about uh, crabs and lobsters in terms of, of noise response. So we're, we're filling in these gaps. The relative importance or the relative um, scale um, across taxonomic groups um, and, um, it, it's going to be a harder question to get to. Is it more important to X than it is to Y? Um, right now, we're filling in the documentation of um, just how many uh, species are, are affected to begin with. OK, great. Thank you. Um, and I'll t give Layla a quick break. Um, there was a question as to whether the presentation would be available outside of the webinar. Uh, outside of this webinar, and yes, a recording will be available, and it will be available on open channels as well as the MPA Center's website. Um, so if you're interested in receiving that recording, you can uh, email me, Sarah Carr, or uh, anyone you've got information about the webinar from, and, and they can send you uh, the link to the, to the recording. Okay, let's see. And we have some ecological questions. Um, do we have any sense of how much whales will acclimatize to increases in noise? Could the threshold of adverse impact be place specific? Hmm. Those are two really good questions. Um, and I'm just going to be semantic and annoying about acclimatize for a minute, only because there has there's a lot of throwing around of another word, uh, habituation, within discussions of how animals are, are coping or could cope with noise. And it's been really helpful as more and more stress biologists, a lot less stress biologists have gotten involved in the noise issue um, to hear them help us articulate what exactly it is that habituation is, which is um, um, over time animals under repetitive conditions um, no longer having a stress, a physiological stress response. That sort of uh, what that means is that for us to invoke that animals in an area could be habituated to noise means that we'd have to know something, first of all, about uh, their stress response. And almost unilaterally, we do not. And in the few areas in, uh, in which we started to have little glimpses into how animals are dealing with chronic noise influence, there is, in fact, some sort of glimmers of uh, the opposite condition, that is that they are in fact chronically stressed and that that doesn't mean that they don't have to continue to go to noisy places to, to make a living, uh, but that you can see changes in their stress conditions when you remove that chronic noise signature. This is the infancy of understanding what's going on there. But it does, I think, um, mean that we need to be very careful about our, uh, uh, con about our illusions that uh, animals can, um, uh, will, will deal with noise in a way that will truly have no longer-term fitness effects for them. And I should say that that's true. Um, you know, the, the infancy we're at with whales um, really um, uh, we shouldn't feel hugely bad about since we're only just starting to understand these truths for people, where there's a lot of effort now being done, uh, being uh, a lot of study being put into understanding people's uh, response to chronic noise conditions. And in those similar, similarly there, we are seeing that chronic noise, in fact, has longer term uh, physiological implications, including cardiovascular effects and some other things. So. This is just the very beginning, but I think it, it, it's, it's a good reason to give us pause. And there was a second part of that question that I've now entirely lost. So. <laughs> yes. Um, could the threshold of adverse impact be place-specific? 
I think yes is the answer, um, and that is going to have to do with the uh, the uh, species that are there. The, th the threshold approach, first of all, and um, is is uh, um, going to be a tricky one anyway. <laughs> but if it would be based on something like audibility of particular signals of importance above background noise, and you're trying to have that audibility be reflective of this. The, the locally important signals to a wide variety of taxa that are using them there, um, then you could uh, immediately go to the fact that the, those thresholds or those audibility um, needs are going to vary by place based on um, the species that are there and the way they're using sound. Okay, thank you, Leila. Um, and well, there was another sort of follow-up question. I suspect the answer is no, just because you said this research is in its infancy. But um, have any population level impacts on whale populations been documented? Population level impacts from chronic noise. I'm going to just make the yes make the uh, the, the leap. Um, and the answer is no. Um, in terms of looking at um, whether we, there there is ongoing work to try to include noise in models of population consequence. That is absolutely ongoing work. And there's only a few populations on the planet. Um, this is work that the Office of Naval Research has been sponsoring for several years. There are only a few populations on the planet of marine mammals where there's enough individual specific information that we can bring possible noise exposures into long-term models of how animals survive and reproduce and therefore into these more traditional population viability assessments. But that is work that's ongoing and, 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 and is really important. There are different experimental modes, however, um, that people are starting to, to look to that would kind of parallel that and would provide a little bit more opportunity to, to get at some of those questions about um, trying to pair up um, either sister species or populations that are, uh, exist in different places on the planet uh, under different noise conditions and look at their status and try to control for some other factors. Um, so those types of, of, of studies are increasingly being proposed and, and will move forward. And then that stress work is going to be really important. Um, and that's, you know, because that's another mode by which we get to fitness that is more cumulative of the various different real wild conditions that animals experience, which is, of course, not noise in isolation, but in fact noise as one of many factors that, it, that the populations are coping with. Okay. And I wanted to let everyone know we have a lot of really fabulous questions. We are unfortunately not going to be able to get to them all, but it's, uh, we have many really, really good ones to choose from uh, for the remainder of our time. Um, let's see. Uh, we'll sort of switch gears for a little bit. Uh, are you making use of local whale watching trips geospatial data to develop and update the set map? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, so, set map is it's um, is a it has has tried to what it has in fact tried to do since it was as as anyone has done whale distribution and density mapping or, or distribution and density mapping of any critter for that matter knows. Um, there's a lot of information out there, and in a one-year crash course, our, our goal was not to um, go out there and collect better data per se, but in fact to do a little bit what the questioner is asking, which is really try to help coalesce the types of data that exist and then do some standardized ranking of it. And this is not to say lesser or more than, but to put things in categories of the type of information content and the types of to, to, uh, the types of management questions that can be addressed by these different what became known as tiers of information about, about um, where cetaceans are. And so when you look at the SETMAP site, and I really recommend you do so, there was an effort first to make this an US EEZ wide um, effort, paralleling what we were doing on the sound map front and to really inventory and provide people with a presentation of where we have information of various different, um, uh, various different tiers and where, where that information uh, and what, can be, what kind of information can be imparted uh, in, in various areas. 
And so in some places, um, higher resolution information, such as coming from whale watches, if it was effort corrected, et cetera, it really depends on um, some of the different ways the data were treated in order to get to distribution and density information. Um, but holistically, this was 10 kilometer squared-ish at the equator um, type resolution data. Uh, and so in a lot of places, it's not going to capture some of the finest grain stuff that you can get from things like whale watching. And um, on top of that, therefore, there are these sort of case study approaches that fill in some of that resolution for some of the management decisions that we all have to make that include finer scale siting information or, or um, uh, just, just some of the other uh, decision making contexts we're faced with. Okay. Thank you, Leila. Let's see. Um, not increasing the noise and possibly reducing it, at least in NPAs and critical habitats, is a primary goal. However, do we have an idea of what is a reasonably acoustically comfortable environment? Can mm -hmm. we define a specific target? Very good question. So, and a very, it's a, it's a very good question, and the answer really overarchingly is we're not at the place we need to be to, to do that yet. What we are is at a place where, um, and that's where I was, I was trying to hone in on the kind of a system that the National Park Service has built in order to design conservation targets. Um, and the reason for that is I really think we can learn a great deal from the experience that they have had in setting those targets over the last uh, 20 plus years um, because there's been quite a lot of revisiting of ideas about, okay, we'll set it at this, okay, no, that doesn't work, um, that is not protective enough of animals or that is um, not reflective enough of the dominant source types or that, you know, for whatever, or that is too complicated and not well taken in by the stakeholders who are engaged. Um, there's a lot, obviously, that goes into choosing those metrics. And um, what has become really a learning curve um, is the information needs uh, from the monitoring side that you need in order to best choose those conservation targets um, and uh, best develop them. And that's really where I think we are for the vast majority of marine spaces. OK, thank you. Um, let's see. It, uh, is anyone tracking strandings and noise bursts near the coast? And I assume they're talking about near Stellwagen, but um, other efforts that you know of that might look at similar things would be interesting. Oh, there's, there's a great deal of work that's gone into the in, in, uh, in NOAA and, um, to uh, uh, developing stranding information relative to noisy events, yes. Um, and that's been a, quite a focus and, and a parallel and an effort that has um, had a lot of crosstalk with um, uh, our, our efforts to develop mitigation and monitoring to address uh, noise impacts to marine mammals. Okay. Um, all right, another question from Brad. With the ability to address impacts that occur outside the sanctuary that enters and harms a sanctuary resource or quality, uh, in the, which is in the regulations of many of the sanctuaries, provide some foundation for dealing with chronic impacts from shipping outside sanctuary boundaries? Well, um, yes. Um, the question is, I think, less whether there's a nexus there um, and more whether our nexus there, which is via, right now, via working with federal action agencies um, is going to be adequate, given that um, with the exception of some more programmatic scale route decision making um, in, in, uh, with the U.S. Coast Guard, um, we need to look to these international bodies um, as a way, as, as a main uh, regulatory um, uh, and, and their regulatory function internationally for shipping traffic. And that's, on a day-to-day -day basis, commercial vessels are not providing us with as many of those, those federal action nexuses for Sanctuary Act consultation. So we need to look to these other processes um, a, a lot of the time um, to try to get at, um, to, to try to get at some of our actions. Uh, that said, there's, there's, 
various different things we work on with shipping interests um, and with the Coast Guard as, as federal partners. Some of those are about routing and consolidation of traffic um, and can affect the distribution of noise relative to a protected areas in ways that are important. Um, others of them, this sort of broad reaching deep water hum, um, those we're going to really need to get at at the scale at which they operate and that's going to be an international an international issue. Okay, thank you, Leila. Um, speaking of international, the IMO has just released its recommendations about reducing the sh ship noise underwater. Do you have any comment on this? Only that it's, it's really um, a, a big step. Um, NOAA uh, brought a proposal to create the correspondence group that um, led to that in 2008, um, and we've been uh, we were the U.S. chairs of that activity for um, several years, and then the last iteration when it moved to the design and engineering subgroup, um, the U.S. Coast Guard took on a lead role. So we've been working very hard on that with, with, with really important partnerships with uh, the, uh, the National Resource Defense Council and the U.S. Chamber of Shipping of America. So there's, there's been, that's been a really important work. What it does represent is, I think, a real recognition of this issue within that body. And um, a, 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 uh, that's not where we were uh, in 2008, for sure. Uh, what it doesn't represent is uh, any kind of mandated reduction in, in, in uh, noise from individual ships. And that ladder, there is, there, it really does pave the road for um, partnerships now directly with in industry to create, um, to fill in some of the gaps in terms of cost um, and uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis of, of some of these build ideas uh, for existing ships and for, and for new builds and um, to really create some pilot programs that will fill in some of that mechanistic data. And that's kind of where we're going now. Okay, thank you. And we'll take one last question, and we'll change gears entirely. Um, I'm a PhD student, and this is from Heather, at the Duke Marine Lab, and we just had a big sound in the sea day where we brought middle schoolers to the lab and focused on teaching them about marine animals and sound and developed a day's worth of activities to do. And I was wondering if you have any favorite ways to bring experiential learning about ocean acoustics to the general public to further emphasize the importance of sound in the sea or any resources you'd recommend for scientists and educators. Oh, that's great. First of all, that's wonderful. Um, and um, the ones that, that I enjoy the most do include um, uh, some, some, some pr uh, uh, projects we've done to um, that really do. I think at the very end of my talk, I, I talked about um, <laughs> reducing sight, or basically for people, helping them reduce their reliance on sight and start to recognize their sound experience, recognize how we as people are utilizing sound more broadly than being able to hear each other. I mean, obviously, we can start with the Mar Marco Polo experiences that we often had as kids, where we do start to realize the directionality and then what it takes to rely on our hearing to locate where and and uh, and uh, locate you know where other callers are, <laughs> um, and you can you know bring that into uh, um, an understanding of what animals are doing. Um, but then going broader than that and having people understand uh, natural, natural uh, sound experience, um, inclusive of trees rustling and footfall and other kinds of um, more uh, adventitious use of sound that are so important to animals. Um, so projects we've done that have, that have tried to, to do that for, for kids um, outside. And, and lastly, I, I've, I've really become interested in uh, making bridges to some of the uh, things going on in architectural, um, like architectural acoustics. There's a real movement um, that recognizes that people respond to natural sound environments um, in, uh, uh, positively. And um, that, to me, implies or, or, or recognizes their increasing uh, rarity. And um, I think that can help people, you know, placing people in noisier versus quieter environments and helping people understand their own emotional responses to that 
um, can be played with as a way of helping people understand the role that acoustics play in, in, in creating conditions for, for animals as, as well as for us. So those are some things. There was something at the end of that question, though, which was all very good. Oh, it was about any resources that you Resources, had that was it. Educators. Yeah. Right. So uh, the discovery is found in the sea. Um, which is maybe a web resource that, that um, Heather's already a, 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 uh, knows about, um, has been an important clearinghouse um, for uh, a, a, a bunch of agencies and other folks who have supported better understanding of underwater noise issues and, and underwater sound in general. And there's a good gallery of sounds and some other things. The Northeast Fisheries Science Center um, has recently, uh, and, and, my, and uh, my colleagues down there, um, Sophie Van Paris and her team at the Protected Species Branch have been really developing their education and outreach tools and have a very good web page also with a good gallery of sounds and some other things. OK. Layla, thank you. This was an absolutely fantastic presentation. And I'd like to thank all the people who asked great questions, too. There's been lots of compliments coming in <coughs> uh, through the questions about uh, what a great presentation. So again, to repeat, for anyone who is interested in a recording of the presentation, it will be um, cataloged both on the NOAA MPA Center uh, website as well as on openchannels.org. And you can also email uh, me, Sarah Carr, uh, or Lauren Winslow, um, or Joanne Flanders um, of the NOAA MPA Center to get a copy of the recording. We can send you the link. Um, Layla, this was fabulous. Thank you so much for doing this. We appreciate you sharing all of your research and knowledge with us. Thank you. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah, and thank you, Layla and Sarah. Okay, and just to wrap up, I'll, I'll wish everyone a, a good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And we hope you can join us for one of the future webinars. Okay, bye everyone. <laughs>